Hi, I'm Michael Etlinger. I direct the Carsey School of Public Policy at the University of New Hampshire. And we have with us Jess Carson, who is a research assistant professor. I got that right. Mm -hmm. And uh, Sarah Bogey, who is policy analyst. Yes. Yep. I'm not so good at titles. I know what they do. All right. And they do great work, an example of which is this latest um, data snapshot, uh, the 170th annual poverty in children snapshot. Not really, but we've been doing it for a few years with uh, just picking up the, the mantle with Sarah's uh, help or in more recent years. Um, so uh, let me just start. What's the big takeaway from this? I like to call these charticles because it's a chart. <laughs> it's brief. Um, what's the big takeaway, Jess? Yeah, uh, for me, the big takeaway is that even though the data refer to 2019, so we're talking about data pre-pandemic, um, one in six kids in the U.S. was poor. That's the big takeaway. That's a lot of children in, living below the poverty line. That's a lot of children in a uh, rich by international standards country, particularly. Um, I just say, I, you know, I did, you know, that work I did where I looked at um, government spending by country. And one of the things I, I ended up just as a little aside looking at was how our poverty uh, compared to other countries, because we have lower social spending than other mm -hmm. countries. So just how, how does like it's I know it's a complicated comparison, but how does our poverty compared to other, let's say, advanced developed relative, you know, prosperous countries? I don't know how our poverty compares to other countries. I'm mostly a U.S. focused scholar, but I do know um, from your work and others that we spend uh, a lot less on social programs in general that support children and families. So I wouldn't be surprised to find that we don't compare favorably to other nations, but that would just be a, a, a guess. I don't have international numbers at my fingertips. Yeah, the OECD has some data on that, which is interesting because it does show us higher, although, again, it is hard to do comparisons because different countries measure them um, differently. Um, well, that sort of gets to uh, one thing I did want to touch on was uh, that I thought was striking in the chart in the charticle was uh, how the city and rural lines converged. Um, you know, this goes back to 2007, and there, I guess, cities are slightly above rural. But um, anyway, I wonder if you could talk to that a little bit. Sure. Sarah, you want to take that? Sure, yeah. Um, um, let's see. I'm sorry, Jess, would you step in a little bit? Sorry, sure, yeah. Um, so, you know, it, it, it's hard to say in any given year sort of what's going on in a particular place, although we do see that the, the sort of change over time. So overall, we've had this, this small decrease in child poverty in 2019. Um, so it was a, a significant decline from 2018 to 2019. And we see that the changes in individual places are sort of all trending downward. And it, cities and rural, like you said, have been trending closer together. The gap between the two of them has been narrowing over time. And it just happens that this year they finally converged together. Now, by and large, the, the two rates are not that different um, in terms of practical rate differences over time. They're, they're pretty close together. They're certainly much higher than in suburbs. And that's largely a function of uh, the sort of work that's available in those places to the parents of these children. That is a function of the family structure in these places. That's a, a sort of um, overall kind of function of the, the family resources and, and kind of um, things that are available to families in rural places and cities versus in the suburbs. Um, one thing I have to ask about you noted uh, in the in in this briefly was the the issues with data collection during a pandemic um, and you know not to go totally uh, nerding out on data sources but I think it's an interesting thing and has kind of broader ramifications so I'm wondering if you could speak to that. 
Yeah. Um, so there was a difference in the data collection periods between the, the ACS, which are the, the data featured in this brief, um, as well as as compared to the CPS, which is the official poverty measure. Um, and that came out just a few days before this. Um, so some folks may have seen the official poverty measure um, at 14.4 percent um, for child poverty and then seen these numbers and said, OK, well, what's the difference? Why is this one higher? Um, and really the reasons behind those differences are many, um, but one of which that was unique to 2019 was the data collection period. Um, so the ACS data collection timeline wrapped up in December 2019, um, whereas for the CPS, um, which gives us the official poverty rates, um, that was done from February to April of 2020, asking families to look back on 2019. Um, so, of course, we know the pandemic really had hit the U.S. and was sort of in full swing during that time period, uh, which likely changed how folks were thinking about income, um, thinking about um, these different financial indicators. So that may have um, also made it difficult to reach families, um, not being able to use the same kind of sampling strategies that we might in a non-pandemic setting um, where in-person communication and interaction was hindered a little bit. Um, so that may be uh, you know, one reason that accounts for some of the differences between the ACS and the CPS, um, although there are also other um, data nerd reasons behind those differences, um, you know, including different sampling designs, different questions, um, in particular income questions are a little bit more detailed in the CPS than in the ACS. So there are some other differences that we want to acknowledge, although of course the data collection period, um, especially this year really may have played a role. Great, thank you. Anything to add to that, Jess? Yeah, I think the, the data collection sort of hurdles that the Census Bureau face are particularly important to acknowledge, mm -hmm. even outside the context of this brief in particular, or this year's poverty numbers in particular, because we do know that the pandemic in, in many ways really uh, stunted the ways that the Census Bureau was able to collect the data that they usually can. And, and of course, this year, that's particularly relevant around the decennial census. So the Census Bureau being closed for operations, not being able to do in-person data collection, to knock on, on doors, to do in-person interviews, particularly for folks who might have been harder to trace by mail or for, who may have had trouble filling out um, paperwork or survey forms, that those sorts of data collection efforts that, were, um, that became salient in the current population survey, those continue to really matter in terms of how we think about the decennial census moving forward as well. Yeah, no, I mean, it's a real concern and we don't, you know, it's one of those things, just hang, grab onto your seats because we don't know where this is going to end up. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I guess the other thing is, you know, as you know, I mean, one in six is a lot, right? Mm -hmm. And um, like, and it's been trending down, I mean, looking at the graphs since, you know, 2010, 2011, mm -hmm. basically. And this is just kind of a continuation of what was happening uh, there. And, of course, the great, there was sort of this, you know, bump up, substantial in the Great Recession. Um, how does this compare to periods earlier, you know, before the Great Recession? So the American Community Survey data that we're using here, the, the data, the particular data that we use go back to 2005. So we don't have data that goes back much further than that to be able to sort of look longer term. But in general, poverty uh, rates from sort of more broadly, more broad perspective will kind of trend with um, recessions, with unemployment spikes. They, they track pretty closely with unemployment. So we can expect looking forward into 2020 that the, the levels, which were still very high, but were relatively better than in earlier years, that those gains that we've made in, in kind of dropping child poverty, that those are not likely to persist in 2020, given the economic climate of 2020. Right. I mean, clearly it seems like there's been, you know, this other work that Carsey has been putting out showing that um, low wage industries are the ones that have, um, you know, really been the hardest hit in the, in the, in the, in the, in, from the crisis that has come out of the pandemic. Um, which kind of like, do you have any sense, you know, from other work on like the families? extent they're in families that these uh, 
children are in, you know, where does their income come from? I mean, are these where are there many? You know, are these all people without jobs? Or are these working for? Or, you know, what's kind of? I mean, I don't want to put you on the spot with numbers, but like, what is the? You know, where 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 does where does income come from for these people? Because they're, you know, they're surviving. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, there are many people who are employed who are poor, including families with children. So for many of these children, the income comes from earnings, from salary or wages. Um, there are other sources that count as income, of course, um, from the social safety net or from other types of um, supports. But uh, there are lots of people who work who are who are um, living in poverty, and for folks who are living that close to the poverty line, where they may be sort of hovering just above and kind of dipping below occasionally, um, those are the kinds of, of families who have workers in the industries that you just referenced. The the sort of hardest hit industries in this recession are the lowest earning industries, and those are the folks who are most likely to be hovering close to the poverty line. So those are are sort of um, folks on the brink that may have been pushed down pretty easily down into poverty, um, given both the, the jobs context of 2020, um, but also sort of the, the supports that they would need to kind of lift them up um, are not all necessarily in place the way that we would need to sort of keep them afloat throughout 2020. So again, um, the 2019 picture is probably pretty different than what we're going to be looking at at this time next year. Yeah. Um, is there any data tracking going on to try to get an earlier read on the impact this year? Just at a, I know they, the census was doing some accelerated work. Um, like, do we have any data that kind of informs our, like, we, we definitely have a, a feeling that this is not going to be good for 2020. Is there any data on that yet? I know that Columbia University has done some work. They published um, some work back in April looking at how, um, you know, if, if unemployment rates were sustained at the levels they were at, how that would sort of track with poverty moving forward. And they've done some updating of that as time has gone on and as the pandemic has, has worn forth. And they sort of found that um, much of the initial sort of support that was there, particularly unemployment compensation, that kind of kept folks afloat, as did the, the stimulus checks. Um, but as those supports have worn thin and, and disappeared, um, folks are, are now back at the same risk of poverty. So these kind of upticks in income that were coming from support sources throughout the year, that may not be enough to lift folks um, consistently above the poverty line through the year if no more supports um, sort of emerge before the end of the calendar year. Yeah, you know, from your, the, I'm sorry, sir. Oh, I was just going to mention that the U.S. Census Bureau has been also conducting the Household Pulse Survey, um, which they begun during the pandemic period. So it's not really a direct comparison to before and after, but does give us a sense of, of the different um, you know, barriers and challenges that families are running up against during the pandemic um, and sort of noting those, um, you know, as Jess was just saying, how some of those sources now of aid um, or assistance or support have been um, maybe running out and we can kind of track over time, um, you know, the impact that that has had on things like food insufficiency in families. Um, so just another way to kind of get it at one piece of that. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that, Sarah, because it's the Household Pulse Survey has shown, you know, when we're thinking about the effects of the pandemic, we thinking about just official poverty, folks falling officially below the poverty line. I mean, I'm not sure that's really the right question. Um, the poll survey is documenting substantial material hardship right now. So families who don't have enough food, who can't pay their rent, who aren't sure sort of how they're going to patch things together for another, you know, week, two, three, four weeks after this, that those sorts of questions are capturing things that the official poverty um, measure isn't necessarily as good at capturing. I mean, it captures the folks who fall below a, a defined threshold, but there's pretty wide consensus that, that threshold, threshold is not equivalent to what a family really needs to sort of suitably make ends meet. And so the questions around hardship, I think, are, are a better um, measure of what families are really facing or what families are really struggling with in this context. And one thing that just occurs to me, you know, from having read your other work focusing on child care and the challenges for that uh, in the current situation, 
I mean, that has to hit these types of, you know, the types of families that these children are in. Um, you know, they can't buy their way out of the problem, to put it kind of bluntly. Um, so I don't know. I mean, you'd sort of think that even if, like, there are swaths of the, you know, that some of the government aid and stuff has held people okay for a period of time while that was going on, these families with children you'd think would be the most vulnerable to problems because you sort of pile on the job situation but they also, they have children by definition, you know, mm -hmm. so the children's, they just snapshot and they're just, they're going to be particularly susceptible to not being able to get back to work because schools are closed and all of that. I think that's right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's a concern. Mm -hmm. um, any other thoughts before uh, we wrap up? Anything I missed ask? I mean, it's only one page long, so there's only so much I could ask you about. Yeah, I think, you know, the last thing I might want to know is sort of how um, uneven child poverty looks across the U.S., sort of between different states, um, between um, the regions of the U.S. that, that yes, one in, in six children are poor in the U.S., but there are places in the U.S. and there are pockets of the population where rates are much higher than that. And that's Frankly, I mean, that's embarrassing for a nation of, of our sort of wealth and our, our capacity to have that many children who are living in households with incomes that low. So I just think that that's important to acknowledge that, yes, one in six is the overall rate, but there really are places and, and people for whom rates are much higher. Right. I think that's a, I think that's a very important point. Um, you know, we sometimes look at broad brush things in data for the whole country and lose track of the fact that there are populations that are, you know, just like, you know, they're, they're, they're where areas and populations where things are hard. Okay, well, thank you both for the outstanding uh, data snapshot. I encourage anyone watching this to read it if you haven't. It'll take you about two minutes. So, you know, good use of your time. And the graph is, uh, you know, tells a, tells a real story. So thanks again. Thanks, Bye. Michael.